By now, the captain could feel the plane making an unexpected descent and banged on the cockpit door. He shouted, It's me. Andreas could at this point see the captain's face on a screen connected to a camera on the cockpit door. Andreas didn't react. The captain then grabbed some kind of extinguisher or oxygen tank and attempted to break down the door. He called back to one of the crew members to rush and get a hidden crowbar while he shouted to Andreas, For the love of God, open this door. This is Red Rum, a podcast focusing on the true victims of crime. On the 23rd of April 1999, Leia Druppel was born. She grew up in Lipronsdorf, a village outside Heitem am See in Germany. Like most teenage girls, She loved to hang out with friends and watch American sitcoms. She had a very good relationship with her brother, Henrik. The two of them would come home from school, turn on the TV and watch their favourite, The Big Bang Theory. Both siblings had a great relationship with their mother, Anne, and the house was full of family photographs. Leia grew up loving music and acting, She enjoyed being on stage, and theatre was her one main love in life. Not only did Leia enjoy music, but she was known for writing her own songs and playing along to them on her piano. One morning, Leia arrived at school at Josef Koenig Gymnasium in Holton am See, when she was informed that 16 students across three different Spanish classes in the 10th grade would be chosen to go on a week-long exchange program organised with the Institute of Linares in Barcelona. The chosen students would fly from Germany to Spain and then spend a week with a host family, being immersed in the culture and lifestyle and would hopefully pick up a few Spanish phrases along the way. Leia was desperate to be chosen. She was incredibly smart and sociable and this trip would not only help her gain a deeper understanding of the language, but also allow her to connect with some brand new friends. The day soon came when the names of 16 students would be picked out of a hat to go on the week-long exchange programme. Leia was ecstatic when she heard her name called, along with 13 other girls and two boys. The group would be chaperoned by two teachers. On the morning of the 18th of March, Leia finished up at her makeup table and packed up the last of her things to her suitcase and hauled it downstairs. Her excitement levels were quite incredible. She was heading to Barcelona with her best friend and next door neighbour, 15 year old Kaya Vesterman. The pair arrived at the airport and Leia checked she had all of her things. She snapped a photo of her boarding pass and jokingly typed a text to her mum, writing of her anxiety for flying on the low-budget airline. She quickly reassured her mum that she was joking and sent her a voice recording, speaking some basic Spanish terms. She was going to have a great time. The students soon boarded the plane and set off on their travels. The journey was smooth, and once they'd arrived, high on adrenaline, Rosa Marcia Garcia, a professor at IES, arrived to greet them, and soon enough, the teens were sent to meet their host families. The next week was full of museums, incredible architecture, tours of the city, and the thing Leia was most excited about, learning about the live music and performing arts venues. After almost a full week, jam-packed with activities and excitement, the 16 students and two teachers arrived at the airport, ready to board their two-hour flight home. 
They arrived at Barcelona's El Prat Airport into Terminal 2 and boarded their Flight 9525 with no issues or problems. Once on board, the plane was due to leave at 9.35am but sat at the gate for just over 25 minutes waiting for confirmation of runway takeoff. The plane took off at approximately 10.01am. Leia heard Captain Patrick Sondenheimer over the speaker. He apologised for the late takeoff and said they would try and make up for lost time whilst en route. Captain Sondenheimer was flying the plane with his co-pilot Andreas Lubitz that sunny March morning. The captain mentioned to Andreas that he had forgotten to use the bathroom before they boarded. Andreas said that he could go any time. At 10.27am, somewhere just over the French Alps, the plane reached its cruising altitude of 28,000 feet and the captain told Andreas to begin preparing for landing. This meant performing a number of routine tasks, including checking the latest airport and weather information, gauging fuel levels, and making sure the landing gear was all working properly. Andreas responded to this by saying, We'll see. At that point, the captain didn't make any reference to Andreas's odd response. It's possible that he didn't really notice. Andreas then said, in reference to the captain needing to use the bathroom, You can go. You can go now. The captain then made his way to the cockpit door, opened it, and called back, You are in control now. Andreas responded with, I hope so. The captain then closed the cockpit door behind him and opened the toilet door. At this point, Andreas locked the armoured door to the cockpit. This mechanism was implemented and became mandatory after the 9-11 terrorist attacks. This meant it would be impossible for the captain to enter back into the cockpit without Andreas first unlocking the door. Andreas then reprogrammed the autopilot to accelerate the descent, making the plane go from 38,000 feet to 100 feet in just a few minutes. At this point, air traffic controllers did detect there was a problem. They tried a number of times to contact the plane by radio, but no one responded. By now, the captain could feel the plane making an unexpected descent and banged on the cockpit door to be let back in. He shouted, it's me. Andreas could, at this point, see the captain's face on the screen connected to a camera on the cockpit door. Andreas didn't react. The captain then grabbed some kind of extinguisher or oxygen tank and attempted to break down the door. He called back to one of the crew members to rush and get a hidden crowbar while he shouted to Andreas, For the love of God, open this door. At this point, Leia and the other passengers and crew could feel the unexpected decline and the panic of the pilot was clear. At this moment, an alarm signalled, the kind that you would hear when the ground is approaching too quickly. The captain grabbed the crowbar and attempted to force open the cockpit door, smashing it and pushing it as much as he could, but to no avail. Andreas calmly placed an oxygen mask over his mouth, but said nothing. The captain shouted, Open this fucking door. Another alarm went off, signalling, Terrain, terrain, pull up, pull up. Less than one minute later, the right wing of the plane smashed into a mountain at around 5,000 feet high and the plane, moving at more than 400 miles per hour, exploded into thousands of pieces. Meanwhile, Leia's mum and other family members of the 16 school children 
were completely unaware of the events unfolding in the French Alps. As far as anyone knew, at least at this point, the plane had just lost contact. There were no confirmed casualties and the families of the schoolchildren hoped that they had missed their flight or boarded another. Perhaps there was more than one German Wings aircraft flying over the Alps at that time. Rescuers discovered the true extent of the wreckage over the next hour. Colonel Jean-Paul Bloy, a senior officer who had reached the scene, said, The debris is scattered over a hectare. There are a dozen large pieces of wreckage. The rest is scattered widely. It could take us several days to evacuate all the bodies. All 144 passengers, including the 16 students and two teachers, as well as six crew members, were confirmed to be dead. Leia's brother Henrik was in school at the time of the crash. The school's teachers and students were utterly shocked, and after detailed recordings from the black box were recovered, the world was horrified at what had happened on board Flight 9525. The fact that someone trusted to safely guide members of the public to their chosen destination could intentionally kill 149 people was unbelievable to the family and friends of the victims. To understand more about why and how this disaster happened, officials needed to look into the man behind the name everyone had been speaking about. Who was the real Andreas Lubitz? Some details quickly emerged about the 27-year-old co-pilot. He was born on December 18, 1987. He had a pretty normal childhood. Andreas became a glider pilot and after leaving school, was one of only 5% of applicants accepted to train at the prestigious Lufthansa Flight Training Pilot School. Whilst there, he had, however, suffered a, quote, heavily depressive episode, which caused him to take a break from his flight training for a number of months. His depressive episode was accompanied with suicidal thoughts, and treatment for his symptoms included strong antidepressants. Medical reports state that the shift in mental state came in part from modified living conditions. It was Andreas's first time away from home, and he gained an unhealthy obsession with not failing. He was also described as having the constant ringing of tinnitus, a symptom that is often associated with depression. Eventually, a doctor declared Andreas was completely recovered, and his student pilot's license was restored, along with his fit-to-fly medical certificate, on condition that he have specific regular examination. Andreas was able to continue flying. It's noted that any further psychiatric treatment for depression would result in his automatic grounding. Andreas was likely aware that his past mental treatment could affect his ability to fly, and whilst completing further training, he lied when filling out a US Federal Aviation Administration document. He did not disclose his conditions or treatment he had previously had, and was actually found out. Just four days after Andreas had lied on the form, a German aviation doctor noticed the false statement and reported it. This could have resulted in prison time for perjury and a permanent flying ban. However, Andreas was told to be truthful on his forms and he was allowed to fill them out again. This time he was honest and he was accepted to continue flying. Searches of Andreas's apartment revealed some shocking discoveries. A tablet device showed a history of searches for ways to commit suicide, including producing carbon monoxide, drinking gasoline, which poison kills without pain, and on the 20th of March, just four days before he murdered 149 people, Andreas searched for information about the lock mechanism on the A320 cockpit door. 
officers also found a journal entry dated March 22nd, which said, Decision Sunday. And scribbled next to it was flight code BCN for Barcelona. Also written were the words, Find the inner will to work and continue to live. Deal with stress and sleeplessness. Let myself go. There was a torn up sick note found in the apartment that included the date of the crash. Investigators stated that this supported the assessment that Andreas hid his illnesses from both his employer and his colleagues. Investigators also didn't find any indication of a political or religious motive for the crash, nor did they find a suicide note. Andreas's actual behaviour, at least to the people around him on the days preceding the crash, seemed normal. A pilot he travelled with on the day before noted that he was acting normally, and his girlfriend at the time said that the evening before the flight, the pair had gone grocery shopping and Andreas had seemed fine. The next morning, Andreas had been in the cockpit ready for the outbound flight to Barcelona. He had actually switched the plane's autopilot to the lowest setting of 100 feet before quickly switching it back to normal, before air traffic control had noticed. It's now thought that was a kind of test run for what was about to come on the return journey. Following the tragic events that took place on March the 24th, 2015, the German Aviation Authority implemented a rule that required two people to be in the plane's cockpit at all times. The airline immediately paid families up to €50,000 each for funeral and travel expenses, but unfortunately weren't prepared to pay much more. The deliberate actions and subsequent deaths caused by Andreas mirror a number of events prior to the German wing's disaster, one of which resulted in the deaths of 33 passengers and crew. On the 29th of November 2013, Flight TM-470 left Mozambique's capital Maputo at 11.26am and made the journey to Angolian capital Luanda due to arrive at 2.10pm. The plane didn't make its scheduled landing and the last contact made from the plane was when it was over northern Namibia. The preliminary investigation report found that the pilot Captain Herminio dos Santos Fernandez had a, quote, clear intention to crash the plane and that he manually changed the aircraft's autopilot settings. It found that the co-pilot left the cockpit and a little under two minutes later, the captain locked the door. After another minute, the captain initiated descent and manually adjusted the speed. The voice recording received from the black box revealed that there were a number of alarms going off during the descent and loud bangs on the cockpit door, presumably from the co-pilot who was locked out of the cockpit. At the time, Mozambique Airlines had guidelines in place that required a cabin crew member to be present in the cockpit if the co-pilot needed to leave for any reason but these weren't well known or adhered to. By the following day, the wreckage had been discovered and over the next few days, patrols worked to retrieve belongings for loved ones and the black box. All 33 passengers and crew were declared dead. Investigation into the captain found that he had experienced life-changing events in the run-up to the murder-suicide. His daughter was in hospital for heart surgery at the time of the crash and divorce proceedings had been ongoing for over a decade. In November of 2012, his son had died in a suspected suicide. The captain didn't attend the funeral and in fact the murder-suicide plane crash happened almost exactly one year after his son's suicide. Unfortunately, I couldn't find information on all of the victims of the German Wings disaster. But of course we know that there were 16 students and two teachers. 
A statement uploaded to the school's website said, The news of this terrible plane crash in France has shocked us all. 16 young students and two female colleagues will never again return to our midst. We mourn our students and pupils. Our deepest sympathies go out to the parents and family and friends. We are all stunned and unspeakably sad. The Guardian released a statement from Robert Tanzil Oliver, the father of an American citizen who was killed in the crash. They reported Oliver said that he urges those who lost a loved one in the crash to not focus on the last 10 minutes of the flight. Quote, Think about the good moments, the wonderful moments. Two other American citizens, Yvonne and Emily Selke, were killed. A spokesperson from Emily's sorority house said, quote, As a person and friend, Emily always put others before herself and cared deeply for all those in her life. Marina Bandre Lopez Belio and her baby son, Julian Prax Bandres, were killed. Marina was living in Manchester in the UK. Her husband said, quote, We have been living in Manchester for seven years. Marina was an editor and colorist, and we were both working in post-production for film and video. Marina was visiting her family in Spain for her uncle's funeral. She bought the tickets at the last moment and decided to return to Manchester quickly, as she wanted to return to her daily routine as quickly as possible. Leia's mum has spent the last few years working to continue Leia's legacy as a hard-working, extremely gifted, musically talented young woman. This is taken directly from the Leia Droppel Theatre website. The Leia Droppel Theatre is supposed to be a living memory of Leia, a theatre for children and young people, and a meeting place for music and theatre enthusiasts. In projects, courses and performances, young people are to be taught about music and stage play under experienced and creative guidance. Discovering your own strengths, gaining self-confidence and developing fun in creative activities are the goals of our theatrical work. There is a video on YouTube, I don't speak a word of German, but the video is full of passionate, loving individuals who are talking to Leia's legacy. The most moving moment, I think, is when Leia's mum gets up on stage. She is clearly so, so proud of this incredible theatre, opened in honour of her daughter, and all the people who have turned up to remember and appreciate Leia, and all of the students. A few students sing a song in English about missing Leia, and that in itself is heartbreaking and full of feeling and love. With many thanks to one of our listeners, Carolyn, for this suggestion, and Larissa for some stellar help with the German pronunciations. <laughs>